Our tea is sitting down with award-winning journalist Matt Kennard. Thank you very much for joining us today, Thank Matt. Thank you for having me. Now, my first question to you is about the series of essays that you wrote that's become very popular, Irregular Army, focusing on all sorts of flaws within the United States Army, from neo-Nazism to alcoholism and to kind of less serious issues like people being overweight in the Army. When you were working on this, what, which one of these topics was the most shocking for you when you were researching? Uh, the neo-Nazis is obviously the most shocking because these people people hate um, everything to do with the Middle East and their goal is to uh, kill what they call hajis. So obviously that's a shocking um, result of the war on terror as the, narr the mainstream narrative is that we, the West, are taking democracy to Iraq and Afghanistan but yet we're sending these uh, neo-Nazi troops to do it. So, but I mean, that's the most shocking but again, gangbangers is another one which is uh, gang members from all over the West Coast have been uh, in the military since 2002, um, they are not committing atrocities in the same way that the, the neo-Nazis are, but again, the military is trying to take them out now. Now this whole uh, issue of neo-Nazism in the army, how did it come about? How did you come across this and when did you realize it's actually a much bigger issue than people might think? Well, I knew when I went to graduate school that there was a problem with the US military in that they couldn't get enough recruits and they were explicit about allowing felons in and people with low IQs. They changed the regulations so they could get more people into the US military. Whereas with Nazism, obviously it's not going to play as well uh, in, the, in society, so they kept that low. So I decided to investigate um, via FOIA requests, via interviewing uh, neo-Nazi soldiers that had returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. And what I uncovered basically after uh, six months of investigation was that it, this was a, a, a military-wide phenomenon that had been allowed to happen under the Bush administration, um, under the cover of the press. Um, no one was actually covering it. They were covering other sections of the military, but not this specific phenomenon. So I spent the next year looking into it and uh, eventually published it. And even after publication, the U.S. military made no comment on it. So they have, they have done nothing about it. Do you have some numbers as, a, as to sort of how many people <coughs> do see themselves as neo-Nazis? The well, it's difficult because the U.S. military don't keep specific... Um, data on neo-Nazis, they, well, they, they couple them together with gang members, so it's impossible to say. Although there have been FBI reports that have, they said they uncovered 203 neo-Nazi veterans, but in terms of hard, hard numbers, there's nothing really. What about uh, social networking sites? They really sometimes tend to give away the numbers of people who are neo-Nazis, who are racist in the military because they come out and publicly say it on you know, websites like Facebook. For example. Yeah, well, there's quite a funny website called NewSaxon.org, which is Facebook for neo-Nazis. So I did quite a lot of research on that. But again, with social networking sites, people can say what they want. It doesn't have to be true. So it's quite hard to build a case for um, this phenomenon on people showing off on a neo-Nazi website because you have no proof that what they're saying is correct. But I mean, a lot of it is very shocking. We, we looked at um, newsaxon.org and we looked at uh, websites like Facebook and uh, I mean, there, there was a lot of bravado about I'm going out to the desert to kill Iraqis, I'm doing my, my mission as a white militant, this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, as, as a... As a shocking phenomenon. It's shocking, but it's not the whole, whole deal. What are the consequences of, of this? When, when a person like that leaves the military, do they go out and train other people? <laughs> Part of the mission is to go and kill brown people in the Middle East, but also to bring the training back to the US to start what they call a race war, which they envision as um, a war between all the races in America and eventually the white nationalists will take power. I mean, it's a crazy idea, but these people really believe it, and there's enough of them to make it a very um, worrying phenomenon. I mean, and coupled together with the fact that gang members are bringing back a lot of expertise in military training to the United States, um, certain people within the gangs and certainly a Nazi said to me that they hope that the U.S. will erupt in a bloody revolution. Have you wondered uh, whether or not the U.S. officials might be somehow interested in this in terms of if they have someone that aggressive inside the military they don't have to worry about you know more emotional sides like post-traumatic stress disorder or something like that. Well um, I think neo-Nazis can still get post-traumatic stress disorder but having talked to the neo-Nazi troops um, or some of the neo-Nazi troops that went to Iraq they did say that their superiors were quite who were aware of their opinions um, often sent them on missions which were seen as the more dangerous ones because they were what they called hardcore so um, there is a U.S. In I mean, there's a military interest in having hardcore troops or troops that 
have a sort of warlike mentality. But I actually don't think the US military, um, this is a conscious thing that they've done. This is basically something they've had to do because they can't get enough troops. So it's not, to do, it's not an ideological preference for any Nazis. It's more to do with the fact they can't um, get enough troops. So they have, they have quietly um, got rid of the, the regulations. Now you said that the US military started hiring people when they kicked off the war on terror and didn't really check their backgrounds. What about now? I mean, is this still the situation, or was this something that was going on only during the Bush era? The Bush era is where it all kicked off because obviously they were missing their targets by huge amounts, and the occupation forces were huge. The occupation in Iraq is now winding down, um, plus the fact that the financial crisis has put a lot of people out of work, so it's made the military more. But what do you expect? Hey, come on, this is a warlike country. We come from that northern European, basically the northern European genes, the blue eyes, those blue eyes. Boy, everybody in the world learned real quick, didn't they? When those blue eyes sail out of the north, you better nail everything down, motherfucker. <laughs> nail it down, strap it down, or they'll grab it. If they can't take it home, they'll burn it. If they can't burn it, they'll fuck it. <laughs> That's what happened to us.